next we okay. talk about the cardiac cycle. Um, the cardiac cycle refers to the filling of the heart and then the contraction of the heart. Um, so during diastole, um, you can write the definition for diastole as relaxation and filling. Relaxation and filling. And then for systole, this is when the heart contracts. Systole is when the heart contracts. All right, so which valves are open during diastole or filling of the heart? The tricuspid and bicuspid. Yes. Yeah, so the tricuspid and mitral valves are open during relaxation or filling of the heart. And then when the heart contracts during systole, which valves are open? Aortic and pulmonic. Okay. Aortic and pulmonic. All right, the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, innervates the heart. Um, there's a branch that stimulates the heart rate and increases contractility. Which branch is that? Yes, the sympathetic nervous system of the autonomic nervous system. Sympathetic. And which branch inhibits heart rate and decreases contractility? Yes, parasympathetic. So when you're getting here to take your exam and your heart is pounding, um, that's your sympathetic nervous system, causing your heart rate to increase, contractility increases. But then after you've had lunch and you're nice and relaxed, and you don't need your heart rate to be so fast, and then it slows down. And that's the parasympathetic system takes over and slows down your heart rate. All right, so the, the muscle fibers that are in the ventricles, um, the cardiac muscle fibers, they have sodium, potassium, calcium um, in different concentrations outside the muscle fiber cells and inside the muscle fiber cells. And that's going to be, um, this leads us into looking at EKGs. So it says the cardiac muscle fibers keep high concentrations of positive ions just outside their membranes and high concentrations of negative ions just inside the membrane. And this creates an electrical charge across the muscle cell. And that electrical charge is called the membrane potential, but most commonly it's called action potential. Action potential means that there's a potential for action to occur. And the action of a muscle is to contract. So because you've got a different charge, a different electrical charge outside the cell compared to inside the cell, um, there's a possibility for action to occur when those charges change. So it says at rest. You could stick a little voltmeter on the cardiac muscle cell and measure what the charge is outside the cell. Um, it would say zero. And you put it inside the cell, and it says it's minus 90 millivolts inside the cell. Um, so there's a difference in charge from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. What ions are involved in maintaining this difference in electrical charge? And it gives you three blanks. Potassium, calcium, and salt. Um, so, um, sodium, potassium, and calcium. There's a lot more potassium inside the cell, um, but there's a lot more sodium and calcium outside the cell. So that's the background information you need to understand what depolarization means. 
So it tells you here when a cardiac cell receives an electrical stimulus, the inside of the cell changes in polarity from the minus 90 millivolts to plus 30 millivolts. So it goes from having a negative charge to having a positive charge. And what causes it to change is just the movement of sodium. Sodium was outside the cell and it goes in the cell and now you've got a positive charge inside the muscle cell. So once the cell has gotten a negative charge, no, I didn't say that right. Once the cell has a positive charge on the inside, it can contract. So once the cell has a positive charge on the inside, now it can contract. And then after it contracts, then the ions go back to where they normally are. So the sodium has to go back out of the cell. And now the charge will change back to negative on the inside of the cell. So when it goes back to a negative charge, that is called repolarization. All right, so we said that action potential just means there's a potential for a cell to contract. It tells you that an electrical impulse spreads to the cardiac cells and blank will occur. So what is the word that you would put there? That yes, depolarization. So the inside of the cell becomes positive. It goes from minus 90 millivolts to plus 30. That's called depolarization. And then when it goes back to its resting charge of minus 90 millivolts, what is that called? Repolarization. Re so you write that one in also. All right, so the conduction pathway is made up of, you can write down what it's made up of. These are nerve cells, nerve cells that travel through the heart and stimulate muscle cells to contract. Nerve cells that travel through the heart and stimulate muscle cells to contract. That's the conduction pathway. It's a bunch of nerve cells. And it stimulates the heart muscles. The conduction will begin with the SA node. Oh, it's on the next page. It gives you a blank to fill in, and you're going to put in SA node. And S and A stand for sinoatrial, S I N O A T R I A L, sinoatrial node. It's located in the right atrium near the superior vena cava. An impulse is initiated here. So this is where a normal impulse begins. Then the impulse will spread over the atrial muscle to the AV node. All right, let's look for that in the picture. Um, so there's a bundle of nerve tissue up here by the superior vena cava um, in the right atrium. And that's the SA node. And then there's branches that will feed the rest of the atrium. <coughs> It'll 
cross over and go into the left atrium, the right atrium, and it all ends up down here at the next bundle of nerve tissue called the AV node, atrioventricular node. All right, so blank is located in the septal wall of the right atrium just behind the tricuspid valve. What are you going to put there? AV. Yes, AV node. Um, conduction to the ventricles is delayed here to give the ventricles adequate filling time. Um, so what it's telling you is when the impulse reaches the AV node, um, the AV node will hang on and not spread the conduction right away. Because um, what needs to happen is that the ventricles need to fill with blood first before the conduction tissue tells the muscles to contract. So there needs to be a little bit of a pause in conduction, and that's what the AV node does. It'll hold the conduction for a very small portion of a second, and then it'll feed it to the rest of the conduction. So blank penetrates the fibrous separation between the atrium and the ventricle. Yes, the bundle of his. Um, his is spelled H I S. The bundle of his. And then the nerve fibers entering this interventricular septum will divide into. The right and left bundle branches. Yes, very good. It's a good review for you. The right and left bundle branches. And then the smaller branches of each bundle spread throughout the ventricles. Purkinje fibers. fibers. All right, so after the AV node, the bundle of His goes through the thick membrane to get to the right and left bundle branches. And from there, goes to the little Purkinje fibers that spread throughout the ventricle muscles. All cardiac tissue has automaticity. And what that means is the ability to depolarize spontaneously. So if you could take out all the conduction tissue and just keep the heart fed with oxygen and a blood supply, um, the heart could continue to contract on its own. So it has the ability to depolarize spontaneously. So the SA node, if it was disconnected from the um, nervous system, it would still, um, let's see, how do I describe this? So the nerve that feeds the SA node, if you cut that nerve off, but the SA node is still intact, then it'll continue to initiate impulses 60 to 100 times per minute. So SA node disconnected from the nerve. All right, and then the AV node, if it's not receiving a signal from the SA node, if the SA node somehow gets damaged, then the AV node can initiate impulses. And it will initiate impulses at a rate of 40 to 60 beats per minute. And then if the ventricles are not getting a signal from the AV node, then they say, okay, well, then we're going to initiate our own impulses. And if the ventricles initiate it, it'll do it at a rate of 20 to 40 beats per minute. Um, so this is going to come in handy when we're looking at EKG rhythms and you wonder why the rate is so slow. It could be because there was damage to the SA node and the AV node, and then the ventricles are the only thing that are still initiating impulses. Um, rhythmicity just means they depolarize in a repetitive manner. Okay, so for an EKG, um, when measuring it, oh, and then with ECG, EKG, um, it's, yeah, it's electrocardiogram, and in English we spell cardiogram with a C. 
Um, this started in Germany, and um, cardiogram in German begins with a K. So that's how ECGs started out as EKGs. And EKGs have pretty much stuck. Um, at the hospital, you'll hear either one. Sometimes you hear them, I would say most of the time you hear it referred to as EKG, but sometimes you'll also hear it referred to as ECG, which is probably more appropriate, but we're creatures of habit, I think. Um, so the action potentials conducted through myocardial fibers during depolarization produce electrical currents that eventually make their way to the body's surface. So when those cells are going from a negative charge on the inside to a positive charge on the inside, that's what we're detecting when we stick EKG electrodes on the chest. Um, electrodes placed on the skin and attached to a specialized voltmeter can detect small voltage changes as the heart depolarizes and repolarizes. Um, this voltmeter is called an, it's the machine, yeah, electrocardiograph. And the paper tracing that you get is called an electrocardiogram. Um, so an ECG is a recording of voltage against time. There's leads and electrodes used to record the EK ECG um, that may be placed directly on the chest surface or you can even attach it to arms and legs and you, you will still um, sense the changes in the voltage. If you put a lead on the chest, it's called a chest lead, but if you put the leads on the arms or, or legs, it's called a limb lead. Do you want to write that down? So chest lead is on the thorax, limb lead is arms or legs. When you put the electrodes on the body, they have to have good contact with the skin. So somebody that's really hairy, you won't get a good EKG tracing. And what you need to do is shave off a spot of hair so that you can put the electrode directly on the skin. Or if the skin is wet or if it's oily, then you have to use an alcohol pad and clean the skin before you put the electrode on. So I just have, electrodes must have good skin contact you may have to shave hair. If the skin is wet or oily, use an alcohol pad. Does that make sense, or do you want to write that down? All right, you'll start off when you put electrodes on the patient and you hook the wires up to the electrodes. Um, you start off with them in a certain order. And the order that you start off with is you put one on the right arm, one on the left arm, and one on the left leg if you're doing limb leads. If you're putting them on the chest or chest leads, again, right arm, left arm, and then the left leg would go over the ribs anteriorly. When you put the electrodes on the chest, you get a better picture because movement of the arms and legs creates artifact in your tracing. Like instead of seeing a smooth line, you'll see squiggliness. And the squiggliness happens when you're moving around. So putting the leads on the arms and legs and for the patient's moving around, you won't get a good tracing. <clears throat> so it's better to have it on the chest. All right, there's three main electrodes needed to monitor an ECG. Um, the first one, write down negative. There's a lot of notes on this slide, so you're gonna write tiny. So you wrote negative, and then next to it, write 
place on right arm or right mid clavicle. So place on right arm or right mid clavicle. On the next line, put positive. Place on left leg or lower left ribs anteriorly. Place on left leg or lower left ribs anteriorly. And the, the third line, write down ground the ground wire. Place on left arm or preferably under the left mid clavicle. So left arm or left mid clavicle. Okay, some more to write down. Um, negative the, the electrodes are color coded, or the electro wires are color coded. So for negative, it's white. Positive is red. And the ground um, wire is black. So the way that I remember that, <coughs> is white on right, red on ribs, and black left over, or black left shoulder. You want to write it down, or yeah. you can think of something else? I like that. White on right. Red on ribs. Black left over, or black left shoulder. And then you hear about Eindhoven's Triangle more in textbook. Never heard anything mentioned about Eindhoven's Triangle um, at the bedside. Um, but what it is, is when you're placing um, the charges differently on the bottom, um, and you're picking up the signal from the heart um, in different ways, it, it changes the way the tracing looks. Um, sometimes you can see the left ventricle better one way or the other, so that would be a reason. Um, what I want you to write down on your paper there is for the different placements, electrodes are not moved. For the different placements, electrodes are not moved, but the setting on the EKG machine but the settings on the EKG machine or monitor will change the polarity. So essentially that can cause contraction? No, no, we're, we're just monitoring something. We're sensing um, heart depolarization and repolarization. Right. And we're starting off saying that the one on the right is positive. Right. But we can tell the machine, we'll make that on the negative one. And make this one positive instead of the ground. Oh, okay. So you can change them. Yes. Professor, can you repeat that sentence again? I'm sorry. For the different electrodes? Yes. Um, so I have the electrodes are not moved, but the setting on the EKG machine will change the polarity. Is that the sentence you need? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what part do you have so far? Just repeat the whole thing. Okay. Um, electrodes are not moved, mm -hmm. but the setting on the EKG machine will change the polarity. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.
So <clears throat> for lead one, it'll tell the electrode on the left arm to be positive. And it'll tell the electrode on the right arm to be negative. And then that's called lead one. So when you're looking at an EKG monitor, you can select different leads to look at the heart muscle. So if you're looking at, if you select lead one, then the machine will tell, okay, that electrode that's on the left arm um, or left middle clavicle, make that one positive. And make the one on the right arm, instead of that ground, make that one negative. And now let's see what the heart looks like looking at it from that angle. All right, the one that I gave you that we start off with, with the white on the right, that one was negative. The red on the ribs started off as positive. Oops. That is called lead two. When on the right arm you've got negative and on the ribs or the left leg you have positive. That's considered lead two. This is usually lead two that's used for continuous monitoring. And then for lead three, we tell the machine, okay, make the, the left arm or the left clavicle electrode negative and make the left leg or, or the ribs positive. And that's called lead three. So this is important to know. It says the heart depolarizes in a base to apex direction, meaning from the atria to the ventricles. So that wave of depolarization of the cells going from um, negative on the inside to positive on the inside, it starts off at the base of the heart in the atria, and then it'll spread through the ventricles. The electrical current generated by depolarization flows in the same direction. So, current flowing toward a lead's positive electrode will generate an upward deflection on the EKG tracing. Um, so when we see the ventricles depolarizing, we'll see the tracing going upward. As the negative to positive is moving towards that electrode, it'll make it go up. But if current is flowing away from a positive electrode, we're going to see it go down. So when we're looking at an EKG electrode, you know the, the big QRS, that, that big thing on an EKG? That's the ventricles depolarizing. Sometimes you see it pointing up, sometimes you see it pointing down. And the only reason you're seeing it differently is because of the charge of the electrode. So it could be in lead three instead of in lead two. Um, MCL1 is a popular lead in the ICU and it uses a fourth electrode and it tells you the fourth electrode is placed below the left clavicle. So when you're in the ICU and you're assessing your patient and you're seeing four on the chest, it's because they're using that fourth one to monitor um, in MCL1. And why? Why can't they just use lead two like everybody else? Well, it tells you on this last bullet. It says this lead is effective for monitoring QRS complex dysrhythmias. So something going on in the ventricles, MCL1 will notice it best. It's best for noticing P wave changes or something going on in the atria. Or if there's a defect in the bundle branch. And it sees PVCs well too. So that's why they like to use that lead. This is showing you a picture of MCL1. Is it labeled there anywhere? <coughs> no. All right, so you have to label this on your paper. MCL1. And everything is moved around. As we started off in lead two, we put our, the negative on the right and the positive on the left. 
They've got everything completely switched. Negative is over here, positive is over here. And then they've got two ground wires. All right, an EKG is graphed as voltage over time. And I'll go through the different waves and then we'll stop and do the rest after lunch. All right, so looking at an EKG tracing, we see the P wave, and that's this little blip. And the P wave is, shows up when the atria depolarize. Then the signal is sent to um, the AV node and then through the bundle of Hiss. And then when the ventricles depolarize, we get a big, huge spike. And that's called the QRS complex. Um, what we don't see in here is when the atria are repolarizing. But we do see when the ventricles repolarize, and that's called the T wave. So the P wave is when the atria depolarize, typically takes, what, two little boxes, 0.06 to 0.1 seconds. The QRS wave is also called the R wave, and this is when the ventricles repolarize. Um, we will be counting the little boxes. We'll start after lunch, though. Um, but whenever you start counting how many boxes, how many little boxes the QRS takes or the R wave takes, you start when it leaves the baseline until it returns to the baseline, and all of that is considered the QRS. So it should be two to three little boxes. And then the T wave when the ventricles repolarize. Oh, and then we've got the PR interval to look at. Um, this is the time required for the sinus nodes impulse to travel to the ventricles. When you measure the PR interval, you begin with the beginning of the P wave to the first ventricular deflection. And that's going to be the PR interval. And it can take three to five little boxes. Longer than that is abnormal. Here it shows you the PR interval. You begin with the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS. That's your PR interval. Um, the ST segment is what's between the QRS and the T wave, and that's called the ST segment. And it should be on flat and at the baseline. I don't think I ever see it flat on the baseline, but that's what it's saying is normal. Um, so we'll take a look at yours. You guys are going to get a tracing of your EKG, and then I'll have you tell me all these things after you get the tracing. Okay, so the rest we'll do after lunch. The refractory period. Um, so this is a part of the EKG tracing and what happens when a stimulus is applied to the heart. So it says during the QT interval, beginning of the QRS to the end of the T wave is the QT interval. Um, it takes less than 0.4 seconds and it represents the general refractory period of the ventricles. So I need you to write down what refractory means. And it means not responding 
to an electrical stimulus. Refractory period means not responding to an electrical stimulus. All right, so in other words, if there's a, a stimulus that comes either from the um, conduction, from the SA node to the AB node to the ventricles, um, if there's like an unusual arrhythmia, <coughs> salut, then nothing will happen. The ventricles will say, hey, I just depolarized. I can't do that right now, and nothing will happen. Or if, electro, if electrical shock is applied to the chest, the ventricles will say, hey, I just depolarized. I'm not doing anything right now. So it's you know, refractory to a stimulus. But as repolarization progresses, some of the ventricular muscle fibers are repolarized. So the muscle fibers repolarize. And then at the peak of the T wave, you've got like half of the muscles have repolarized, the muscle cells, and half of them have not. This is a vulnerable period of time during which part of the heart can respond to an additional stimulus. A depolarizing stimulus during this time can create electrical chaos in the heart and render it functionless. We need a picture. Oh, I thought I had a picture on here. Let me just go forward and then I'll back up. Yes, I do. Okay. All right, so the ventricles depolarize, and now the muscles can contract. And then after the muscles contract, now all the ions have to go back into their resting position. And so that's a refractory period. You can't give the ventricles another electrical stimulus at this point in time. But during the T wave, this is when the ventricles are repolarizing. So some of the cells have repolarized, and some of them have not. At this point in time, if there's somehow an electrical stimulus given to the heart, it'll send the heart into ventricular fibrillation, and all of the ventricular muscle cells will just get very chaotic. You won't have the normal um, contraction of the heart. You'll have a quivering heart and no blood pressure, a cardiac arrest. Um, so it's, it's considered the relative refractory period and the reason that period of time is dangerous is because an electrical stimulus can cause the heart to go into ventricular fibrillation. So let me repeat it so you can write it down. So if there's an electrical stimulus during the second part of the T wave electrical stimulus during the second part of the T wave, it can cause the heart to fibrillate, F-I-B-R-I-L-L-A-T-E, fibrillate. Which is cardiac arrest. All right, so on, on your exam, if you're asked, why is the relative refractory period of the EKG dangerous, what would you respond? Because Yeah, so an elect electrical stimulus during that time will cause the heart to go into ventricular fibrillation. So now for the EKG, I'm looking at the graph period paper. It says one small box equals, and then there's a blank view to fill in, and the small box is 0 0.04 seconds. And when you add up five small boxes, that's equal to 0 0.2 seconds.
So this is what the graph paper looks like as it's going through the machine. The machine will draw the tracing on the paper. You see little tiny boxes in a lighter pink color and then bigger boxes in a darker pink. So one big box holds five little boxes. So five little boxes, they're 0 0.04 seconds per box. All right, when you're looking at an EKG, you're going to go through the same criteria each time you look at an EKG. And your first criteria will be to determine the rate, and there's a slide coming up for each one of these. Um, after you determine the rate, you look to see if the complexes are, have regularity, meaning they're, they're spaced evenly apart. Next, you look at the P waves and determine first if they're there and if they're normal. Then you'll measure the PR interval and see if it's three to five boxes. And then you'll look at the QRS complexes. All right, so as far as counting, there's different ways of counting the rhythms. And I'll teach it to you in the classroom. You'll have it on your exam. But when you're at the hospital, the EKG paper just prints the heart rate right on it. Or the monitor shows you what the heart rate is. So this is more for learning theory. The first way to assess heart rate is to count the number of QRS complex, complexes in a six second strip and then multiply by 10 to find out how much it is in a minute. Okay, do we have a strip to look at? I guess that's the only one. All right, so this is a six second strip. And how do we know that? We could count all these boxes see how many boxes there are. Fifteen and fifteen, so thirty big boxes is six seconds. So looking at six seconds, what is the heart rate? Sixteen. Yeah, so you just counted the number of, um, and you count the QRSs. And if there's six QRSs on the paper, you just multiply by ten, and now you know what the heart rate is per minute. The second way is to count the number of boxes between the R to R intervals. So remember a QRS is called an R interval, or an R wave. So in between two R waves, you count the number of boxes. Uh, if you count the little boxes and divide the number into 1500, it'll give you an accurate rate. Or if you count the large boxes, you can get a close estimate. So if there's only one big box between um, each R wave, you know just by a quick look that you've got a heart rate of 300 per minute. If you see two big boxes between the R waves, you know the heart rate is 150 per minute. So it's a good way of looking and getting a really quick estimate. Um, three boxes is 100, four boxes 75, five boxes 60 per minute, and six boxes 50. You may end up having this memorized by the time <laughs> the class ends, but if not, that's okay. <clears throat> All right, so we have, let's look for an R wave that lands on a thick red line. Here's one right here. Let's count the number of big boxes between here and here. We've got one, two, three, four, almost five. So five boxes, that means the heart rate's about 60 per minute. It's so much easier than multiply. Well, you got to know all of these ways. The other way is we can find out how many small boxes and divide by 1,500. So you get out your calculator, 1,500, divide by, and then you count the little boxes. Well, each big one has five. So five, 10, 15, 20 about 24 little boxes. So it would be 1,500, divide by 24, and that will give you the rate. All right, so those three ways. All right, the next thing, uh, oh, and then it talks about a normal heart rate is between 60 and 100 per minute. So you would just make a comment like, you know, the heart rate is 50 per minute, that's bradycardia, or it's greater than 100, that's tachycardia. 
The next thing you look at is the rhythm regular or irregular. So to do that, you have to measure the R to R intervals. So I can give you calipers. You have them in the drawer. And you can um, set the calipers between the first R to R wave. And then you just lift it off the paper, move it over, and check the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And if they're all the same space apart, then you say it's a regular rhythm. And you've got like a box, a box and a half, still a regular rhythm. If not, you can just use a piece of paper and mark it with a pen. I'm giving you a handout in one second. Let me finish this. Okay, then you look at your P waves. Is there one before each QRS? And then is there a QRS after every P wave? So when I hand, give you the handout, that's what we're going to do. Um, we look at the PR interval. Is it three to five little boxes or is it more? And then is the QRS complex normal? It's going to be um, three little boxes or less. Okay, so let me give you the handout and that's what we'll work on. Actually, I want to go back. A silver button. I can do this. <laughs> 